Well, do you think you look okay till you see something? <laughs> <laughs> We're just doing the transfer to Facebook Live. Mm -hmm. Okay, it looks like live. Was that? Yep, yeah, it should be good. Okay, I think we're live. You never really know, uh, but the comments will start to come through at some stage and that will reassure us. But, so welcome everybody who's joining today for um, another one of my, well, maybe it's me channeling Tony Jones in his original <laughs> role on Q&A, but a chance to really have a discussion <laughs> and get your input about an issue that, that matters a lot to me and I know matters to a lot people and really these days is a, a real life and death issue and joining me to do that is Jed Carney who's the Assistant Aged Care Shadow Minister and it is wonderful to have you here Jed. Jed's coming to us from uh, the very constrained situation in Melbourne and I can see it looks like you're in a lounge room there Jed. You're certainly at home aren't you? I'm, at, I'm in my house. I'm in the spare bedroom actually. <laughs> there you are. Um, well, look, we're really grateful for your time and to be able to have a discussion with you. Um, and I know that we're going to be drawing on a lot of the things you've had life experience about, not just experience as a shadow minister, assistant minister. So thank you for giving up some time. Now, the format of this for people who haven't been involved before is Jed and I are going to have a discussion, but we're going to draw on your input. Uh, for this particular discussion, a lot of people have sent through questions to me and I have about 50 uh, questions or, or 50 people have sent through questions. Can I just say from the outset, I'm not going to be able to go through every single individual question. So we will look at the general issues that have been raised and it's everything from staffing to quality of care through to, to food quality, to transparency of the operation, to some of the the concerns about for-profit organisations running aged care. So there's a, and there's a whole lot more in between. But the way you can have input right now is via Facebook. If you put a question or a comment into the Facebook comments, um, I have my mobile phone here and my team will grab that question and, and get that through to me. It's not quite as sophisticated as the ABC studios, but we're doing our best with the technology we have. Um, so, so look, Jed, let's just have, uh, give a bit of an overview, I guess, of the some of the issues you're really seeing. My view is that aged care was broken long before COVID, but that COVID has really highlighted the precarious situation many residents and their families find themselves in. What what are you, what's top of mind for you in, in all the issues that there could be around aged care? What, what's top of mind for you? Well, the safety of residents and people in our aged care system is top of mind for me right now. I mean, your, um, your audience may not know that I was a nurse for nearly 20 years and I worked in the public health system here in Melbourne but I also uh, was very close to the aged care system. I was a nurse educator and I went into nursing homes and I helped nurses understand how to care for elderly people. And I know from a long way back that just what you said is true. The aged care system has had many, many problems for a long time. And they have never really been dealt with, in my view, properly. Um, we have chronic understaffing, as you would know, uh, we have no need for minimum qualifications for people working in the sector. Uh, there are issues with funding, there are issues with the regulator monitoring and compliance of standards. If you ask me, there's even issues with standards. Um, so there are a lot of things that I think haven't really served our elderly well, and they are our most vulnerable, Susan, as you know, in our society. Um, not just residential aged care, but with aged care packages, we know that people are waiting years to get a package. Um, tens of thousands of people actually die waiting for a package, which is an incredibly terrible indictment on the system. And I'm really proud to say that Labor has fought for a better system for a long time. We tried to implement some measures last time we were in government, uh, but a lot of those measures were taken away by Tony Abbott when he was elected and who actually went about sort of um, halving the dementia supplement, for example, and freezing funding and 
Uh, we saw some real budget cuts occur during that time, which didn't help the system at all. So there's a lot that needs to be done in the sector. <coughs> Pardon me. I don't have terrible these, I promise you. Just a bit croaky today. <coughs> and, um, uh, and really systemic failures that, as you say, have been brought to the fore during the COVID crisis. Those cracks have really been made evident. And what is even more distressing is that the government, the federal government, Scott Morrison's government, was warned what would happen um, during a pandemic like this. We had outbreaks in New South Wales in New March and Dorothy Henderson House, and there were reports written after those outbreaks to say, OK, here's what we need to do to get ready for a wider outbreak, and that wasn't done. And so now we're seeing the disaster and the tragedy unfold in Victoria. Yeah, and look, I, I, there's a couple of things. Now that hopefully we've um, our audience has settled in, there's a couple of things I'd, I'd like to acknowledge. And one is that while I, I'm gathering on Darug land, I'm not sure what land you're meeting on and joining us from today. I'm on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. Uh, so let's say I'd like to acknowledge, and, and I and pay respects to elders past and present, but also acknowledge any Aboriginal people who are joining us today. And we'd love to hear your thoughts on any um, additional issues that, that are within the system that's failing so many people. The other acknowledgement I wanna make, Jed, is that um, your partner's father actually died of COVID, not in aged care, but he was elderly. So I think all our hearts went out to you when that occurred. Thanks, uh, and and it, you know we the the losses, um, are, I don't think people have quite comprehended the losses that we've experienced. And in this region, a number of families had connections to Newmarch House, and there were deaths, and there was also a long, long time of fear. And, and I, I think that for me, you've just it's where you finished your comments. The not learning from what we saw in Newmarch is just extraordinary to me. And that only this week, we may get some sort of announcement from the government about one, one thing they're going to do that might help. But that report that shows four months ago, there were warnings about the number of staff available. Um, in terms of, can we talk about, let's start by talking about the staff, because my experience of my dad's aged care, fantastic staff, but gee, they run off their feet. Um, so COVID is clearly, we already had a problem. They were already understaffed and, and too busy. What are the issues that, I, I guess we can talk about the problems and lots of people have, but where do you see the starting point for trying to tackle some of those understaffing issues? Is it all about the government just putting more money in? Is, is, that, is that the key? Mm. It seems to be that. A lot of money gets thrown at the sector willy-nilly without any real strategic approach to where that money has to be spent and very little accountability or tracking for that money. Just as a little aside, Susan, we know that a lot of money was set aside, for example, for training in personal protective equipment to be put on and taken off and how to use it. But we heard from the Royal Commission into Aged Care that only one in five people actually received, one in five carers actually received that training. Uh, so where did that money go? Was it actually disseminated? Did people take it up? I mean, we just don't know. There's very little tracking of that sort of money that's been put into the system. So no, I don't think money is just the answer. Of course, more money always helps a system, the system, but that's just it. And I'd just like to give a shout out to everybody who is working in aged care right now. We think you are wonderful and you are doing the work of angels. There's no doubt about that. Um, as was said on Insiders the other day. And um, I agree with that. Uh, it's a hard job and you do your very best with the resources you have, which brings me to the point that so often um, in nursing homes, we hear that there just aren't enough staff just to start with. I mean, we have heard dreadful stories through the Royal Commission of nursing homes that have, you know, 100 residents with three people maybe on overnight um, and one nurse, one um, registered nurse with a couple of with two carers or so, which is really impossible um, workload. You couldn't possibly give appropriate care. So it brings us to the point that there are no standards or no enforceable standards around staffing levels. The other issue, of course, comes to training. And we know that most people take their job seriously in aged care 
and do get qualifications. We have Cert 3, Cert 4. There's all sorts of qualifications you can do in dementia training. They're not supported to get that financially. Often their remuneration doesn't reflect that they have done extra training. Um, it doesn't help with retention. And there are certainly no laws or standards that say you have to have any training in a nursing home. So that begs a lot of questions about some of the, the, um, the not so good things we see in, uh, in care. And the other thing, of course, is about skill mix. Um, so uh, I always say that nursing home, it's not babysitting. You don't go into residential aged care just to be minded. You know, people go into residential aged care because they need care. And you would know that with your dad being in a nursing home. If they didn't need to be there, you'd have them with you. Yeah. But they need specialised care. And so, therefore, they need people with a range of skills to care for them. They might be diabetic. They might have dementia. They might have heart problems. They might have um, all sorts of um, conditions that make it impossible for them to care for themselves that require complex care. And so we need a range of people working in aged care facilities that have those cares, those skills, from carers, nurses, through to occupational therapists, maybe physios, and, of course, the enormous question of um, medical care in nursing homes and actually getting doctors in there to do uh, the work that the medical profession needs to do. So that is a real issue, I think, with nursing homes, and there's no standards, there's no um, minimum requirements around that, and that's what really worries me um, about the provision of care in our nursing homes. Now, I'm not going to name the person who sent this question in, but she's worked in an aged care, one of my local aged care facilities for about 18 months as an uh, administrative officer. And she says one of the key issues she's seen is um, the huge reliance on casual staff. Uh, and so, as we have talked about, um, in a whole lot of sectors, the reliance on insecure staff and casual workers uh, is is very high in some facilities. Um, her question is, you know, why can't those roles be made permanent instead of casual? And it, it it's a great question. It's a great question. And of course, this is not just an issue that is um, specific to aged care. This is something that is right across our entire economy right now is precarious work, insecure work. You hear a lot about the gig economy. And uh, the COVID pandemic has really shown just how terrible and how, how fragile that has made our economy and people's lives is awful. So yes, we do see it in aged care a, a lot. People are employed casually, they're employed part-time. Um, I can only think that it is a cost-saving measure mm. and it's not good for people with dementia or um, in nursing homes not to have that continuity of care, to see the same people every day and to get routines. And of course, it has made the pandemic much worse here in Victoria. What we're seeing is that because people in working in aged care have to work across multiple facilities just to make a living because they can't get a full time job, which is crazy. If you ask me, why, why not? Mm -hmm. um, they're working across facilities, so they're possibly taking um, yeah. cross infecting. And this is a real issue um, in the nursing homes here. So, um, yeah, it is a really good question. And I think if we had implemented minimum staffing levels, minimum, minimum qualifications, decent pay and conditions, um, we might see a much more stable workforce in aged care, which of course would benefit the workers, mm. but also the residents. So yeah, I agree that is an issue. Um, Here's another comment from a worker. This is <laughs> a really depressing comment actually, um, from, from, I think I can call her Deb. Uh, and she said she's worked in aged care for 20 years. It's not aged care anymore. It's aged paperwork. The paperwork has taken up <coughs> the caring of our residents. It's a money-making business. Um, too many unqualified and not caring workers, caring carers working in aged care, not enough. Mm. So, I mean, how sad is it when, when, when you hear someone who's been in it and has seen the changes, um, how... How does that make you feel in terms of where it should be in priorities for, you know, were we in government, but for this current government? Mm. Well, as someone who's been a nurse, I know that you don't work in um, the healthcare industry to become rich. <laughs> you don't. But you work in it because you get a great deal of satisfaction out of the job that you do. You deserve to be paid well, don't get me wrong. 
Um, but a lot of people love their jobs because of the satisfaction they get from caring for people. So when your job suddenly becomes about paperwork, and maximising the income for your facility, which is what that paperwork is, because you you try to work the figures so that you get the most amount of money you can from the government out of the system. It could be heartbreaking. I, uh, my heart goes out to your person who asked the question. The um, aged care funding um, tools or, or system uh, is Acme. something. ACFI, aged care funding instrument. I didn't want to use that. I hope people know what that means, but um, it is a very complex system complex tool and there is actually trials at the moment trying to simplify that and change that system but I'm very old Susan now I remember the old days when aged care funding was quite no, simple I think we're the same age oh. so let's let's not have this too old very old business quite we're young and lovely young and wise <laughs> we're, we're full of experience and wisdom I remember when there was a thing called cam sam funding when you got funding for capital so that you could keep the maintenance and upgrade on your nursing home and you got funding for care yeah, for right. the service side of things. And it was split and it was very clear and it was uncomplicated. And um, then they decided for some reason to, to scrap that sort of system and they went to this very complicated ACFI funding. And, yes, it is complex and it needs reform. The Royal Commission has a lot to say about reforming yeah. the way the system is funded. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and we we'll talk. We need to talk about the Royal Commission. Um, one of the things I I spent um, several years on the board of a community not for profit aged care facility in the Hawkesbury. Uh, a few years, I, and I I um, in between. I think after I'd lost my first election and before I won my first election, I was on the board there. But and that was a real eye opener to me. And we found that in fact we weren't clever enough with the ACFI tool compared to. Uh, a whole lot of more sophisticated operations and needed to change some systems. And actually there were some positives out of that for residents as well in terms of better recording of the support that they were actually receiving. It's not that they weren't receiving the report, it's that it wasn't being recorded. Uh, and that was good information for doctors and other carers and family members. So it is getting that balance right, it's hard. It yeah, yeah, but getting trying to have capital, getting capital to be able to <coughs> improve things, and I've that goes to one of the questions someone's raised, and they don't want to be identified, but it is about um, the appropriate facilities for people with early onset Alzheimer's or younger people who find themselves in our very traditional <laughs> aged care structure. That's another big. Mm -hmm. issue. That is a big issue, young people who there is no supported living um, facilities for um, young people with disabilities or for people with, as you say, early onset dementia. Uh, the government did announce some funding a little while ago, which, um, to be honest, I have no idea what's happened with that. Um, I have... We see that a lot. Good we on see the that a lot. Never um, seen it flow through. No, they did acknowledge that this was a, a very serious issue and we just haven't seen it. And I hear story after story about very young people, maybe in their 40s um, who or earlier, who find themselves living in a nursing home and it's just tragic. So it's an area that needs a lot of work. I know that Bill Shorten, um, who is the Shadow Minister responsible for NDIS, is very aware of this issue and is doing some really wonderful work uh, not only with the disability sector, but with um, uh, real estate and with property developer type of people who are interested in building residential, residential facilities specifically for these needs. Um, there is a lot of scope out there to do this. There's a lot of willingness. There's a lot of people ready, but we just haven't got those policy parameters in place from the government to make it happen. Um, now, I've got a question that's come through uh, on Facebook. Uh, so Hayley, who's listening, says, uh, and she's talking about staffing in a COVID context, there needs to be surge staffing to account for shortfalls. Can we talk about um, what, what the views are around, around staffing in the precise time that we're in, where, where I think at Newmarch, something like 80% of the staff were out of action, and that yeah. had massive <laughs> for residents, families who were trying to get in touch. No one knew anybody. Um, so let's tell me what your thoughts are on COVID staffing issues. 
Uh, it's one of the most serious missteps, I think, that Scott Morrison's government has taken with the whole pandemic. As you say, we knew from Newmarch that there was going to be a workforce crisis if COVID did take hold in nursing homes. And it's one of the first things that should have been dealt with, apart from communication channels, which you all also said was serious because people just can't find out any information. What we knew from Newmarch is that there was no understanding of who was making decisions, who was responsible. The, the, the federal government simply had not set up the structures to deal with this. So there were two very important recommendations that came out of that that should have been immediately put into place. And it just didn't happen. They didn't do it. So when there was an issue here in Victoria, the state government had to step in, um, realising that the federal government did not have those measures in place. And the state government here have pulled workers, nursing staff from the public health system, which is already stretched. Mm -hmm. um, and so people from the Northern Hospital, from um, Monash Medical Centre, from the Austin Hospital, they have actually had to come in and staff nursing homes, which when, you know, the entire workforce had to go, which is not easy. They don't know the residents. They don't know where things are. You simply don't know what's in what drawers. We've heard terrible stories about just pandemonium in the first couple of days of this transition. Whereas if we had have had a proper system in place ready to go, we would have had a crisis response group set up in each state, which is what Julie Collins called for, with a knowledge of all of the um, nursing homes, with somebody visiting them, getting the systems in place, knowing what to do when this would happen. Maybe we could have even had pre-testing of staff season. Go figure. You know, that would have been a good thing to do um, to just make sure there was regular testing of staff in nursing homes so we could monitor, um, monitor the pandemic more closely in the sector. So um, it really was... It only takes, it only takes one case. That's I was right. going to say, it only takes one case to uh, really interfere. Um, you know, and and change the change the future of a lot of people in a, in a particular facility. Um, we have, I was just going to say, I was just talking to one provider here who um, does not have a single COVID case. In he has three nursing homes in Melbourne, and I was asking him about his systems, and he said, well, the first thing he did was ask his staff um, to be tested regularly, and they all agreed, and that is he thinks that is the one thing that he has done. Um, to make a difference and it's just such a simple thing that we could have done across the board. Yeah. Uh, the um, other issue that comes into play for me when we're talking staff and casual staff and Hayley's raising this as well among among a few other issues is the lack of um, pandemic leave for some for some staff that staff <laughs> automatically weren't in a position early on where they could uh, access pandemic leave and even now while it's available to Victorians uh, it's very limited on who is eligible for pandemic leave. Now I can't see the sense in that you know prevention is better than cure we have no cure for COVID the preventing it is our only option. Uh, can, I mean, can you I don't know what, how can they not do it I just can't I, understand it. I can't understand it either I mean it is the most obvious thing and you know, that the trade union movement through Sally McManus and the Labor Party asked for this from the very beginning. You need to have pandemic leave so people can actually go home, get better and come back. And I don't understand the government's reluctance to do it from the very beginning. And I don't understand their reluctance to make sure it's not available across the board. Um, yeah. It is available here in Victoria. A lot of people have said a little too late. Um, it came in too late, uh, but it is here now and it does make a world of difference. So, yeah, it should be available across the board. It should be available as a preventative measure so that people know from the very beginning that if they feel unwell, they have symptoms, they don't have to go to work. So uh, it's, it's a good question and we should be asking Scott Morrison, if you're up there in Canberra, I hope <laughs> that the questions will be coming thick and fast. I hope so. I <laughs> I think this will focus, be a focus of the next two weeks. Uh, so. uh, yeah. And hopefully the screens will be set up so that you can remotely ask a question, even though you're not able to travel to Canberra. Yes, fingers crossed it will all work. We're going to, have, we're going to try, I believe. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, look, the other key issue that's been raised with me on a number of occasions, mm -hmm. uh, including in some of the questions that came in before this, but, but 
in this whole period is the lack of PP access to PPE for mm -hmm. aged care staff. In fact, I spoke to two workers heading to a local facility at a railway station one morning, and I said to them, I was I was offering free disposable face masks, and I said, oh, do you wear them at work? And they said, we're not allowed to wear them at work. And that surprised me that in yeah. a facility, Yes. they were not allowed to wear them um, and I also uh, ran into uh, Shirley at the weekend who tells me that there was and she's just posted a comment actually there was a nursing home uh, that told staff that they had to pay for their own protective gear what? Uh, and it was, I, I just can't believe it it's an extraordinary thing to say so so and this is we are giving um the operators of aged care a lot of leeway. I wonder whether, you know, we really need to be coming down a lot harder, not just on staffing numbers, but on the sorts of things we as a community expect. Uh, I mean, what do you think about staff having to provide their own PPE? I'm gobsmacked, I can't tell you. I remember when um, the pandemic, um, you know, it started uh, here, we were, one of the main um, requests that we got from nursing homes in my electorate was for PPE and masks, and we were gobsmacked. Greg Hunt kept saying, the Federal Minister for Health, oh, there's a stockpile, don't worry, there's plenty of masks, um, you know, you'll be fine, there's all this PPE. Well, the two um, parts of our health system that are federal government responsibility, that is primary health care, so our GPs, and our nursing homes could not get masks for love nor money. And we actually, I went out and bought some and had a stockpile in my office and we're delivering them to nursing homes, to GPs. And I might add the other area that the federal government has responsibility for is disability. And the disability sector, we were helping them with, with PPE. They were finding it very difficult to get any. And now we are seeing cases of COVID in Victoria pop up in the disability sector and it is a real worry and we need to really watch that. It's impossible to do disability care one-on-one -on -one and maintain social distance without um, protective equipment. So it's another area, I think, Susan, where the federal government has really let the system down. Um, and to hear the stories that you are saying, uh, I, I saw you post that, I think, on social media and I was really surprised. There needs to be absolute hard and fast rules and you, you know, this needs to come from the federal government. It needs to come from the Quality and Safety Commission. It needs to come from the aged care regulator and it, they need to be hard and fast rules. Um, one of the things that we know has worked in Victoria is the wearing of masks. And you watch all of our nurses and doctors in the public health system run by the states. They are all in PPE. And so I don't see why it isn't the same for those systems that are run by the federal government. And I think we're all understanding initially, not a lot of us had worn face masks before, but now that we're wearing them in supermarkets on public transport, mm -hmm. and I had a, a round table with Anthony Albanese out here this morning speaking on this very issue with the family members who have residents in aged care, just to, just to give him a picture of the sorts of issues we find on the ground here. Um, and of course, we're all going, oh, it's really hard having these conversations in masks, but our nurses, our, anyone in a hospital, our cleaners, our food preparers, they have been putting up with that for months. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's hard yards. I've seen people with bruises on their faces from them. Uh, and I think we've all taken it a bit for granted. And I, But now we appreciate what you're going through in Victoria now. Uh, given that we're starting to do it. Of course, it's not mandatory in, in any situation uh, on pub, in public here, although there are certainly calls for that. Um, now, I've, I've got a question that's come through from um, Jocelyn, and Jocelyn Hoffman is a really well-known local aged care advocate. She has been fighting. She's a nurse. She's been fighting on this issue. Yeah, she's hey, fantastic. Um, and, of course, ratios is a real... Um, underpinning belief for a lot of people working in the sector they say without ratios now um the ratios the ratios is no one has really done good commitments around ratios it goes to the issue of staffing levels where where have you ended up on this issue well uh coming from a nursing background in victoria where we have in the public system mandated nurse to patient ratios um 
in our public health system, I do know the difference that it makes. Uh, and it does, God, it beggars belief when you tell people that in our aged care system, there's no rule around how many carers and nurses you can have or you need to have to look after a certain amount of residents. It just, it absolutely beggars belief. And to the point where people don't know when they're looking for a nursing home for their loved one, you know, you look at the surrounds, you look at the gardens, you look at the facilities and you say, yes, this looks lovely. But very few people know to ask, is there a registered nurse on every shift? Mm -hmm. How many carers do you have? Do you have minimum qualification requirements for your carers? You know, these really are the questions that people don't know to ask because they would just assume that that is in place and they're not. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I am a real firm believer personally that we need to have minimum staffing levels. There needs to be some sort of arrangement to say, if you have this mix of these residents with these types of um, care needs, then there is a certain number of staff that you will need to care for them. And uh, I think we need to do a lot of work around that. And I suspect the Royal Commission will also have a look at that. And it's not just about the number of, of carers and the number of staff, it's about um, the, the qualifications and the different professional skills that they bring uh, with them. And uh, your um, viewers might recall that uh, the Royal Commission made some very scathing comments about staffing levels and skill levels uh, in nursing homes. And it's not fair to those people who do go to an effort to get their Cert 3 and their extra bits of qualifications to make sure they do a good job, to know that somebody else can come in and get, well, let's face it, get paid exactly the same amount of money to try to deliver the same care without all that effort being put in to get the skills. The yeah. system, we really need to look at that. Um, okay, the comments are coming in and questions coming in thick and fast. Um, another one from Jocelyn is around the online platform Mabel. Uh, now, this isn't something I know a lot about. So here's what she says is just she's concerned that the Minister for Aged Care, Richard Colbeck, has allowed the online platform to fill the critical skill shortages in the aged care sector. How, are you, you're, I'm sure you're aware of what that is. Um, I should be aware of what that is. Is it an online employment Yes, it's an online employment. And, and Jocelyn's concern is it doesn't offer sufficient safeguards for extremely vulnerable residents because there's no yes. guaranteed accuracy of criminal history checks, uh, she says. Oh. So I don't know the platform, but there's some oh. concern yes. raised about it. Actually, it raises a very good point that I should have mentioned before, and I'm sure Jocelyn will um, appreciate this, that not only are there no minimum staffing levels and, and no minimum qualification requirements to work in aged care, and that would bear out in an online employment um, tool. I think I agree with Justin's concerns around that. But um, there's no regulation of staff who do work in aged care. And we have heard some terrible stories of neglect and abuse, you know, that dreadful situation in Adelaide recently where the, I think the person was actually charged. Yes. Um, yeah, just, yeah. Um, uh, there needs to be, I think, a register where if you work in aged care, you need to register. And just like there is for doctors, for nurses, for teachers, teachers. Um, yeah. there are. And you need to, if, if you don't meet the standards of your profession, then you are struck off the register and it is well known by everybody that you can't work in the sector. And I think we really need to look at some form of registration as well. And, uh, and I absolutely agree that uh, I'll have a close look at Mabel and just see what the requirements are to register and to be employed in that sector in, in through that platform, because it does sound to me um, that there are some alarm bells ringing about that. Yeah. Um, now, this is a really concerning message that's come through on the Facebook feed from Kelly. She's been told to self-isolate from her nursing home and, and she hasn't identified where she is. Mm -hmm and they refuse to pay her for shifts she can't attend. And she's also been told she's not allowed at her second job. So here we go. We've just got the yep. classic example of the person who needs paid pandemic leave for their own security and also for the wider societal effect that it has. Um, so thank you, Kelly, for, for sharing that comment. Um, okay, I'm conscious of time and I've got, I'm looking at a pile of questions 
Uh, by the way, those of you who've sent questions that are very precise, um, we will that we'll be doing some follow up if we're not already working with you on the issue we'll be doing follow up and there'll be other things that I send through to Jed that are quite detailed that we weren't able to get to uh, today yep. so one way or another you no know, Jed's at home she's in lockdown <laughs> just get, we'll give her some st more stuff to do uh, but it'd be really good to um to get some feedback on some of those issues that that are quite detailed um can we can we talk about the for profit uh, issue? Um, so in the roundtable with Albo this morning, this really this was quite stark, and not even just for profit versus not for profit, even the lack of transparency around how the not for profits, the big not profit not for profits. Um, don't really have to be accountable for the aged care funding that they receive. It isn't transparent what they spend it on, how they spend it, whether it gets siphoned off onto other worthy, no doubt, but other projects. Um, I think this, I, I don't, it's a hard conversation to have, uh, but, but it goes to the heart of the model that's been created. And I don't know how you unpack that model, but I'd mm. like, I, I, you know, the minute I saw, um, the big banks investing in aged care a long time ago now, the warning bells off went off for me when, when investment banks um, who are very good at making money can see an opportunity to make money out of aged care. You know, that's where I have concerns and I'm sure you would too. Yes, in fact, there are, a, I think there are three big aged care providers who listed on the stock exchange. So they are actually disseminating profits, not only to themselves, but to shareholders. And immediately that you get that dynamic, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting this is everybody who works for a profit. We have some very good for-profit providers uh, in the system, very, very good ethical um, companies. But the minute that you are worried about shareholder dividends, I think it brings a whole different focus to your business. And uh, you worry about that, you know, you worry about making sure that people who've invested in your company, like the banks, actually get their fair share of the dollars, dollars that come from that. So it does create another level of concern. But I think the answer to this problem, and we've seen some pretty, you know, we oh, you know, when we saw the pictures of the people in at Epping Nursing Home down here, you know, people were dying. It was a very terrible, um, COVID went through there dreadfully. And then there were pictures of the owner of that nursing home with his Maserati and his million dollar, you know, mansion. And I'm not suggesting, you know, for a minute that there are, that that was why that he was, people were dying, but it's very hard to marry those two images. Don't you think when you see that? So, That's cognitive dissonance. It's just, it's, it actually makes you feel sick to think about how, what's led to that. And there might be, you know, we don't know all the story, but mm. it doesn't pass the pub test, that's for sure. It doesn't pass the pub test. Thanks, Susan. Good way to put it. So I think the answer is in what you said. We need very strict regulations about how taxpayers, taxpayer subsidies are spent. Mm. They need to be tied to care. And there needs to be true transparent acquittal that that money has been spent on care. Now, we do know that providers um, send financial accounts back to the Department of Health and Ageing and they put out a report. In fact, another report came out today or yesterday and I'm going to look at it very carefully. And it does show the profitability of the sector and um, there's, you know, there are some acquittals made to the Department of Health and Ageing about the funding that they get. But... There really, it doesn't really dive deep down into, uh, you know, we hear of nursing homes where people get half a banana and a party pie for dinner, you know, so. And, or, and we heard that, we heard an example of that this morning. Party did you? Party dinner. I mean, okay, maybe if it's someone's birthday, but yeah. Not very nutritious and not very appetising, exactly. So um, I think there needs to be a level of scrutiny that says, you know, what do you exactly spend on food? What do you spend on nursing care? How many people do you employ and for how long under what conditions? What do you pay people? You know, do you ration incontinence pads? I mean, I have heard this, that people have rationed incontinence pads in their nursing homes, honestly. And I think the Royal Commission is looking very closely at this. 
You would know, Susan, that Senator Griff put a, um, a private member's bill to the Senate, which we supported, calling for just this, that there needs to be transparency and accountability for taxpayers' funding in the sector, and that needs to be made public yeah. so the public can see it. And we voted for that. Unfortunately, the government didn't and some other crossbenchers didn't and it didn't get through. But um, uh, Labor is very firmly on the side of transparency and accountability when it comes to public funding in the sector. No doubt about it. I think, um, you know, the when you're trying to choose an aged care facility and choice is a little bit of a it's not really choice because often it's what's available at the time because no one kind of plans far enough ahead it, you only do it when you have to and mm. then in our case certainly there was some urgency to it for, for all sorts of health reasons not just dads but also mums and we our measure how to find, I mean I think we are really lucky in our community to have so many places that I had already heard very good things about um, and we feel very lucky where where my dad is mm. um, but it's it was it is luck uh, there isn't, as you say, anywhere where I can really go and compare the data. Uh, and it's only over time that you can get a sense if actually it's not quite what it seems or it's or it is. And when it comes down to it, it, it for most of us, I don't think it matters how flash the place is. It is the quality of care and the people who uh, come as soon as they are able when dad presses his buzzer. Not that he's very good at pressing his buzzer. He <laughs> rubs all over than press his buzzer. Uh that is typical yeah uh, so you know there uh, that having that transparency i think for um people who haven't yet reached the point of having to look at aged care gosh if that was a legacy that those of us who've already had to be engaged in it could leave that would be such a good one to know that they don't have to do the guesswork that we all did and mm. and honestly the worry for me is that the glossier your brochure and the better your pr campaign um, you know, the rather than the real things that matter. So yeah, yeah. that's true. So I really think that um, laws around transparency and accountability of funding and a regulator that can enforce standards are two things that would make um, that would help a lot. I think mean that even in a for-profit facility, you can have confidence in the standards that are going to be met there, and that's to me, seems to be some of the things that are missing right now. Yeah. So one of the things that has come up um, in a COVID and a pre-COVID context is the um, amount of allied healthcare that is available in aged care, mm. but also things like diversional therapy and really those things that, that help the day have richness in it rather than just something that you pass. Uh, and of course, COVID has, I think that was already a challenge to be able to make sure there was sufficient funding to allow for the physio that was needed. Someone today said to me that um, a physio used to see her mum once every four months, which seems extraordinary, um, as opposed to you know, having a really good re regime. Mm. But COVID has made all that so much harder. And I do worry, as have several people uh, about the fact that even in good times there isn't always enough activity no. happening in some facilities. How on earth do we tackle this though in a COVID context? Yeah it's very difficult. In fact a lot of aged care advocates have come to me and said that one of the main um, checks on standards I guess mm -hmm. if you would like to say in a nursing home is the fact that they can visit on a regular basis and they would make sure that mum or dad actually had lunch and would sit there and be able to feed them so at least they knew that they got one good meal a day if staff were too busy to make sure that they got a full meal any other time and with COVID of course we haven't been able to visit so a lot of people are very worried that their one check on standards has gone and so it's really opened up this whole worry about the whole system why do we feel that way like why do you feel that you need to be there to make sure you should have confidence in the system? And it is a worry. They're worried about, yes, are they getting their physio? Are they getting their walks? Probably not. They're probably being confined to their rooms, as we know a lot of people are. And it's really, um, it is a very big concern during this time. And I think it's highlighted for us so many cracks in the system um, that, 
you know, people like yourself and myself and maybe um, your aged care activists have been trying to highlight for a long time. So let's hope after COVID, let's hope that, and, you know, hope the Royal Commission did have a little look into the situation. Um, it ha hasn't gone into it in any real depth, but let's hope that there are recommendations that mean we can have confidence in the system without, even in times of crisis like this. I think it was interesting when I posted a photo about a week ago of a phone that I'd bought dad, which because he can't use a mobile phone and there's no phone in his room and the whole process of getting that connected was quite complex um, and, and also required a lot of ongoing financial commitment to it. So I found a phone that is a mobile phone but looks like a desk phone. And I looked at it and went, oh, dad will know what to do because there's a handset that you pick up and it's yeah. got a twirly cord and it just looks like a phone so it, him, it won't matter to him that it's a mobile uh, and the number of people I, that yeah. commented and went oh where did you find that yeah. and something as simple as that my thinking was uh, that we I thought we might be heading into some more lockdowns where we wouldn't be able to visit and the restricted visits are hard enough but no visits is really tough on dad uh, so, you know, I got it in on the Thursday and on the Friday, we got a note saying that no more visits for a while. Mm, and, like but the difference it makes in knowing, like, I think what it does for dad is if he sits really close to the phone and he picks it up within a couple of rings. It took him four rings uh, an hour or two ago when I gave him a call and I went, oh, he's not answering. Um, but normally he picks it up on the first or second ring and I think what it might do for him is give him a sense that at any time someone might phone, that there's this hope, and hope is such a powerful uh, emotion to have. You know, but for mum, of course, it gives her a huge peace of mind and all of us that we can ring for a chat. We don't have to put the care workers out. We know they're busy and doing really important things and they don't have to race around with a phone, even though they assure us that we can ring at any time. Um, but we just, it's just a reality. We, we restrict ourselves because we don't want to interfere with their already difficult um, and full on job. So you know simple like I would like to see that rolled out to everybody for less than $200 there's a device with a 365 day sim card for incoming calls and then if they want to make up going calls that you know it's not that hard uh, you know you know when, um, when my father-in-law passed away very sadly uh, his uh, wife my mother-in-law um, had to isolate for two weeks Straight after his death, they lived alone and um, she just had no idea about any of the technology because it happened so quickly, you know. He, and Mike was the one who could work the computers and do the Zoom and knew about mobile phones and Wendy just joined in, you know. She'd poke her head in like this and say, hi. And so for that two weeks, she was isolated, grieving, sad. I can't tell you how worried we were about her. You can imagine her mental state and everything. Um, and, yes, there was the phone, but, you know, just trying to, to make meaningful contact with her was very, very difficult and very hard. And my, they're in Canberra and my sister-in-law and brother-in-law used to just go and sit by the window yeah. all day. They took it in turns to just be there where she could see them outside in the window. And so I really do understand that need for connection and particularly in a worrying time because uh, it, it can make things so much worse just not being able to communicate. And, and some facilities have really gone out of the way to make safe visits possible with, um, I know one of our local ones does fence visits. Uh, they've got a, a fence with the um, garden on one side and the resident sits on the garden side at a, a significant distance and the fence sits on the other side of the fence and it's a it's a you know you can it's it's not a paling fence that's it's a see-through fence um, and that would yeah, it's a great idea yeah that's so uh, lovely. yeah so that's Fitzgerald Age Care and I'll say who they are because it's a fabulous initiative right. and they should be congratulated for yeah. that yeah wonderful facilities out there doing great work and we should acknowledge that 
Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, now I'm going to go to some of the questions that um, have come in. And I have to take, because we are so wise and mature, I just have to take my glasses off to read them. Um, okay, uh, that, now these will be a bit random in as much as this, they're coming from a whole lot of different perspectives. Uh, the, yeah, the two, $22.70 an hour payment to nurses, uh, that someone's Kelly is talking about. It is it. She just said it's just really hard. I cannot understand why we're asking people to do work that I couldn't do for mm -hmm. that amount of money. Uh, and then Adam adds, uh, Uniting Care and Baptist Care have underpaid their low income yeah. age workers. Mm -hmm. Should there be greater penalties for those who do who do that? Oh. You're asking an old trade unionist here. <laughs> that don't I, think I know the answer. <laughs> yes, there should. Um, you know, in Victoria, they've introduced wage theft laws and um, it'll be very interesting to see how they work and uh, particularly in instances like this where the facility says, oh, it was just a mistake, we didn't know, you know, it was an accounting error. Yeah, well, that's, in my view, that's no excuse, you know, if, and uh, if you're going to run a business, you have to know how to run it properly. I know you're a small business person, Susan, and you know that you have to know the rules. And to find out that, you know, some of the lowest paid workers in our society are underpaid a lot of money is um, tragic. I mean, I know they will pay it back, but one wonders if somebody hadn't been brave enough to speak up and say, hey, this is happening, um, I know that it's done with the support of the unions, then, you, you know, maybe they just would have gone on forever, you know. And so it's really important that we call this out, that people know about it, that they understand that it can happen and to be brave enough to speak up when they do. Yeah, and then supported when they do speak out. And then supported and then there should be severe penalties for this so that everybody thinks, everybody who employs people will think, am I doing it right? Have I got it right? Let's ask all the right questions. And um, yeah, you know, they they get I think about eight hundred million dollars in government subsidies that um, Baptist Care. So they should be doing the right thing by their workers. And yes, I agree. There should be. That is a very low paid sector, considering the work that they do. And as I said before, there's no recognition for extra qualifications or extra training or anything like that. And so it's something we really need to look at: is the professionalisation of the workforce with regards to pay. And I know when we were last in government, we were really looking at career pathways through and how people move and, and you know, looking at the different roles uh, that perhaps people, I know there was the original issues around some workers who were care workers who might want to migrate into being, uh, having nursing qualifications and, and even from an industrial perspective with their unions, how would that work together? You know, there's a goodwill to do it. Now, Cameron says, Stuart Brown surveys the industry and produces quarterly reports on the financial health of the industry, but you need to subscribe to them. Well, that's classic of the sort of information that should just be made available, uh, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And Denise, who um, has done a fantastic job, she joined me this morning and uh, has now raced to be able to be part of this. So thank you, Denise. She said, this is a great idea, I think. How about a My, My Aged Care does a public website, a bit like the My Schools website, not that I'm saying the My Schools website is in any way perfect, but I get what you mean in terms of having the information the, about the finances, the staffing levels, all those sorts of things that would help in the decision of, of um when you're trying to decide and, and look at a facility. And that's real transparency, something like that. It is that. real transparency. And that would be really challenging, I think. It would be a good thing for people to be able to see. Mm. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'll am i put my glasses back on and check the clock because we've only got a few more minutes. Uh, and I'm being told five, five minutes, I'm being told. This is what happens is people waving at me and telling me things, all the things you don't see behind the scenes. Um, the uh, the elder mis mistreatment and complaints. I do need to ask. In I we have found it challenging when people have phoned us or emailed us with issues around real concerns they have. Getting the complaint system 
is challenging for people to negotiate, navigate and to try and get any sort of response. You've probably seen a lot more cases than me, um, given that you're looking at a national approach, but mm. what's your thinking around the complaint system as it is and how it might be improved? Ah, well, this is a really big issue. Um, people say to me that the complaint system has absolutely not helped them very much. I think the problem, though, is Susan, lies in the fact that the standards are not, the, the regulator doesn't have the teeth, if you know what I mean. So you can make a complaint about a standard. The, um, the you know, the, the um, complaints commissioner can take that to the standards commission, who I think they've been merged into one, haven't they? Have they been merged into one body? Mm, I think I'd be know. asking you that question. As I the, know that. Um, yeah. But... Um, and then nothing happens. So because the, the regulator doesn't really seem to me to have the power or the teeth to make anything change at the grassroots level, at the bedside level. And this is where we really need hard and fast standards. We need, you know, all of those things we've talked about today to be in place. And then we need a regulator with the teeth to be able to go in and say, you are not meeting these standards and here are the penalties as a result of that. And you need to be able to collect all the complaints into a data. There needs to be, you know, somebody mentioned that the sort of the, the tables on the website or, it, you know, there needs to be somewhere that these complaints are actually lodged publicly so that people can and, and understand that there's been results and that these have been the outcomes and that the regulator has looked into them. And I think that is the real problem. It's not so much with being able to make a complaint because there are facilities to do that. It's actually how the complaints have been dealt with. Um, by the regulator if there is a serious misconduct issue or a failing of standards. And that's where we've really got to make the systematic change. And I know the Royal Commission is looking at that as well. Yeah. There's a lot, lot lying on the Royal Commission outcomes and, you know, yeah. we're really waiting for that to come through. Uh, I and I think we are, I mean, we know there are things that could change immediately and you don't have to wait for the Royal Commission to bring out its final report to do a whole lot of things. And it is um, disappointing that we're not seeing that. Um, but for broad systemic change, which I think is what is going to be needed in aged care, needs to be very thoughtful and evidence-based. Um, okay, we are going to run out of time to do all the questions. And, but there, there is one I'm going to ask you as a Victorian. We are hearing um, this blame game happening around who's responsible for what. Mm -hmm. It's always very clear in my mind that the federal government has responsibility for aged care and full stop. Full stop. Um, but, but in my community, there are still people who aren't clear on on where the, they, I guess there's this desire to lay blame, which is not particularly helpful, but more I'm interested in seeing people stepping up and taking responsibility. You've already mentioned that Daniel Andrews, there was a vacuum and he stepped in to uh, try and address that issue. So when you hear people say, you know, talk about this, what are you, what's your response? Oh, I'm quite visceral about it. You know, I'm furious that the federal government was not ready for this. They knew exactly what had to happen. They knew what needed to be in place. Uh, they knew the possibilities of the entire aged care workforce um, being affected as it was. They knew that there had to be training and infection control. They knew that they had to have people on the ground ready to go and that they didn't have that in place, Susan. Aged care is the responsibility of the federal government. It is. And for, you know, it, it's, you, can't, you can't sort of blame state governments for thinking that the federal government would have it in hand and would be ready. Um, and then when um, Dan Andrews stood up and said, well, the government didn't have it in hand, these people are Victorians, because we're going to go in there and do what we need to do, um, everybody was relieved. But that shouldn't have been the case. It, who knows how many deaths we might have not had to see, how, how many people could have been saved if those things had been in place when they should have been beforehand. This lies firmly at the feet of the federal government. I have absolutely no doubt about it. And I'm really furious about it. Uh, and and pa Pablo, you've answered Pablo's question around um, being prepared and he works in resilience preparation. And he also expressed um, you know, concern about the, the action. And it isn't just COVID, it's for a whole lot of other things. So out mm -hmm. here, we, um, we have a quite 
uh, vulnerable power system and, and some of our facilities lose power yet they don't have backup generators mm. and people can go days without electricity so wow. those sorts of the, and it and those sorts of things are not required it's yet another example where you look at the rules and go oh they're not required to have a backup facility so that mm. you know I think I hope that this prepares people for um, a serious, serious decisions to be made, which may well cost more one way or another. Somehow it has to be funded. Um, and yeah, well, you, you, we have a responsibility, obviously, in at a federal level to be um, making up for the stuff that has just been ignored for the last seven years. Yeah, and it's really distressing to see Scott Morrison. I mean, he was on the radio yesterday saying, oh, yes, we're responsible for aged care, except when there's a pandemic. I mean, I'm sorry, that is just not the case. You know, they weren't his exact words, but that's what he was pretty much implying. And you can't do that. You can't just wash your hands of responsibility when there's a crisis. It's when you're needed. Yeah. So, you know. And look, you and I will continue to uh, hold this government to account and to put forward constructive suggestions for how we move yeah. forward. Yeah. But thank you for allowing me to pick your brain for an hour. You and I don't normally get an hour of time to have a conversation um, in any one, at any one time. And thank you to all the comments. As I say, we'll do some follow-up with those of you where I haven't been specifically able to ask detailed things. Uh, but I hope that's touched on the whole range of issues. You know, the one we didn't touch on is home care and... Oh, know that that's a problem. Or can we just say that needs to be fixed? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Have a lot, has a lot to say about that as well. I've been watching, so yeah, terrible. So maybe, maybe um, the next conversation we have might be when we see a bit more from the Royal Commission yep. and we start to see some response to it. But thank you so much for joining me and stay mm -hmm. safe out there. I know you're doing everything you can to help your community. They're very mm -hmm. lucky to have you and it's great to have the chance to talk to you. Thank you, Susan. Thanks a lot. See you later, everybody. Thank Bye, you. everybody.